Howdy, everyone. Okay, Julian, it should. Yeah, should I'm be seeing the invitation. Yeah. yeah. Hey. <laughs> what one? I gotta turn it turn volume down. Oh, my volume was on. Of course. Of course. <laughs> All right. We're still I'm so echoing. Okay. I'm so happy that you are like me with this. <laughs> oh my gosh. Technology for me. I mean, it's been that kind of day. It's just, it's, it, it's echoing guys. Her phone volume is all the way down. Yeah. And so is mine. Try, how about well, her now? AirPods are connected to now? her. Oh, that's better. Okay. Now you we're not. What echoing. happened is when I went live, my volume went back up on my phone. Oh, okay. She got it. Yay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, folks, all of you watching on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We um, laughing. You know, uh, yeah, laughing at us. Please laugh at us. Please laugh at us because, you know, it just is what it is. It's technology. And when you're trying to do a bunch of things at the same time, it just is not easy. No, anyway, especially when you're never on it. <laughs> so everybody, welcome. We're doing Gut Health Week. Um, and today we're really lucky to have Julianne Lee. Um, she's really, really, really science oriented. And she does homeopathy. And she's really into the gut microbiome. And so she makes all these wonderful products from Adored <laughs> Beast. And we're really lucky to have her because she's into the science here, science, and I'm into the, just tell me what I need to give my animals and what I need to tell <laughs> me what I give their animals. <laughs> so you you can do all the research and I'll just tell people how to use it. How's that? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Sounds awesome. good. Awesome. Because I'm not telling anybody how to do anything. <laughs> okay, now. there you go. Um, so we specifically asked if you would come on and talk to us about kitty cats because Cats really are not small dogs. And so commonly, mm -hmm. you know, so commonly we just kind of want to lump them in and just say, well, you know, it's just a smaller version. So we'll just give it a lower dose or um, we'll feed the same thing. And let me tell you, I've been trying to balance a ton of recipes for my new book. And cat recipes are a pain in the butt. I just have to say cat yeah. recipes are a pain in the butt. So they're, they're nothing like, Mm -mm. like the dogs, they have totally different needs. So we really kind of want to address that and uh, kind of help people understand, like if you have cats, um, you don't want to be following all the, the dog centric pages that are talking about yeah. how to do things because it is going to be very different. Yeah. Um, and if you have dogs and cats, don't cut the corners and go, well, you know, they can all have the same thing because they really can't. No, no, not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Um, and I, sorry, go ahead. No. So I just, you know, I, I would love for you to tell us, you know, from your science or your science standpoint, um, you know, the differences in kind of the gut microbiome and yeah. why we have to feed them so differently and kind of where that all comes from. Yeah. So it's, it's a long process. I mean, for me, I didn't really understand it till when I, at my hospital, um, I became the primary clinic for a place called Vokra, which is Vancouver Orphan Kitten Rescue. Mm -hmm. And I saw about 2000 cats a year just through that, through that. Um, wow. I know it was crazy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, everything from trap and release to rescues to tiny, tiny, tiny little orphan kittens oh. being, I know they, they had about 600 kittens a year. Um, that they that they got the SPCA would get them in boxes. People would just leave them on the front porches and stuff, and they would Boca would come and get them. Before that, they euthanized them, right? Because it was just too, too much too much work to, to feed them I mean, and and yeah. really take care of them, right? Yeah, so, unless you have uh, foster parents who are capable of doing those sorts of things, it's really hard. Yeah, and they do now. They have a huge, huge, huge uh, organization. It's a, it's amazing, actually. So anyways, um, I, I, I learned really quickly that what you do with dogs doesn't work. And <laughs> really quickly through different diseases and stress-inducing diseases, diseases and all different kinds of autoimmune diseases and FIV and herpes and all of that stuff, 
that they really are a different species, like very, very different. And uh, one of the things that's interesting, because, you know, I was going to do this podcast today, a couple days ago, I had the vet up and we were doing some stuff with my horse rescue. And she said, you know, horses and cats are so similar. She said, (laughs) I know she said, but animals, herbivore, carnivore, <laughs> except for, except for their food, but their sensitivity and they're like, they're, they're, um, just the way they function and, and, and even some drugs and things like that. And I said, yeah, like they're really, they're cats are just an interesting species in general. So, um, when I was, when I was, you know, from a, from a perspective of, um, the, the food wise, I had a really interesting experience with someone that did his, like a historic thesis on cats. And she was one of my clients. And uh, she came to me one time and she's like, you know, I'd love to sit down and just pick your brain about all this stuff. And, you know, she said, like, they're not meant to eat anything dry because they, they originated in the desert, right? Like in, in Egypt. And that the only way they would get fluid was through the blood of their prey. And that's how they actually absorb their, absorb their nutrition is while they're, while they're digesting. So if they eat dry kibble first and then they try to drink, there's no way with a small length of their intestine that they're ever going to get enough hydration. It's why they're all getting kidney failure. It's why all, they're, all, you know, and then they're predominantly carnivores. They're only getting a really small amount of um, vegetation and that's through the gut of a, of a mouse or, a, or their prey. Right. So I learned very early on about the whole, you know, um, cats not even really being able to drink water properly like their tongues aren't even you know they're not they're they're not even put together with their anatomy in such a way that they can flip their tongue and drink like even a dog right like it just looks like taking a popsicle stick and going in and out of the (laughs) out of the water and expecting a whole bunch of water to go in and then it just isn't in the gut long enough you know so we're looking at kidney failure we're looking at chronic you know dehydration we're looking at so many so many diseases when it comes to cats when on kibble like you know with people and dogs like, i mean i'm not i don't i don't subscribe to kibble at all with with, with anything or anything really mm-hmm. processed with anything my horse is nothing right. um but with cats especially it's just it, it, it's just to me um there's just I don't even think that dry cat food should even be allowed to be sold. I mean, that's, that's how, that's how hardcore I feel. About I would agree with food. that. How do we, how do we make that happen? I don't know. Let's figure it out. <laughs> I've whole, been trying for a lot of years. <laughs> holy, I know me too. And just, just, so, you know, from that, from that concept that they're carnivores and even more carnal carnivores and dogs, that they don't have the ability to drink. And there's so many different things that, that make cats different from, from dogs. And, um, but the interesting thing about the gut is, is the same, it's the same thing, right? Like they're, they're, they don't get, you know, a wolf or a coyote would, you know, scavenge on berries and would chew more, you know, eat larger prey with larger intestines. And so the fibrous tissue that they would be getting from the digestive, like tripe and things like that, right? All of that, that pre-digested fermented um, fiber for dogs, cats, cats don't get that, right? right? So that's, so that even goes to show how much more that they are a carnivore. So when I started looking at probiotics and, and, and things for the longest time, I was using similar, very similar probiotics for, for dogs and cats. Saying that the 14 strains that I did use, I really honed in with hundreds of species and hundreds of strains of probiotics that matched, um, you know, their, their registration and what they, what they achieved would match what I was seeing at the, at my practice. Right. So they were handpicked as, as something that was very, uh, um, very much oriented to, to cats and to dogs. Am I frozen? No, you're good. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, so 
Anyways, as I was doing more and more research on the on the microbiome of the gut, I started to realize that not only do the do the postbiotic effects of probiotics affect the, the the physical nature and the anatomy and physiology and pathology of an animal, but it really, really does have that strong, strong gut brain access. And how when we're using probiotics that are for people, predominantly they're made from cattle. And we have a very different, um, you know, dogs and cats are very different than cows. Like people are more, people are more like cows actually than, than dogs and cats from a perspective of our pH mm. and the ability for those bacteria to survive in such a high acidity, which is what we want with dogs and cats. So I started to dig in more and more with that. And then I started looking at cats get different diseases than dogs, right? They get, you know, we're getting autoimmune diseases. We're getting, you know, cancers. We're getting all of that stuff, but they still have their species specific diseases. And when I got into looking at species specific probiotics, which means that they're, they're isolated from that species. So the dog probiotics are made from dog feces. And then our wolf probiotic is made from wolf feces. And our cat probiotics are made from feline species. So um, when we look at that and we look at the fingerprint of, of how that what that does and when we when we're in the lab and we're really really honing in on isolating those and what do they actually do it was it's really fascinating how when you're using the species specifically for that the species of of that who you're of, treating <laughs> yeah of your what you're treating that and you're taking that strain from that species how almost homeopathically or or very like DNA and very much historically, you're, you're seeing that it alleviates and helps the specific diseases that we're seeing in that species, right? So cancer or, um, you know, FIV or, or herpes or inflammatory bowel disease or whatever. So it's 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 really cool how you know the i like that I, I continue to like the diversity of putting all kinds of bacteria in there right. but when you really look at the the, the the specific species it's it's fascinating what it what it can do yeah and you know it makes perfect sense um that you would because the the prebiotics, which is the fiber that feeds the probiotics, which is the good bacteria that makes the yeah. postbiotics, postbiotics, which is the short chain fatty acids and, and, yeah. uh, you know, all the things that, that we get from those good guys living there. Um, that's where your immune system is. Like that's where things are forming. And so yeah. it, it only makes perfect sense that if you have cat specific probiotics, they're going to be a lot better at attacking feline viruses than a cow specific <laughs> probiotic or a human exactly. specific probiotic. Uh, you know, it's sort of like their DNA is programmed to help with cat things or the yeah. dog probiotic. The DNA is programmed to help with dog things. Um, yeah. But it's funny because it's just hasn't been looked at. Other, I mean, you're, clearly on the cutting edge, but, um, you know, for so many years, people have just said, Oh, I just give them the same probiotic I take. Well, yeah, here's clear evidence for why that's probably not the best idea. Yeah. And I think, I think, you know, I'm really lucky. And I say this at every podcast, I have an incredibly amazing business partner and I'm a real advocate for all animals, right? So, you know, I won't use anything in my products that hurt you know, wildlife, like if we're chopping down forests to get an herb or we're, we're, you know, doing something negative to the ocean or we're doing something negative to, to, uh, to a certain species of plants, you know, I'm very, I'm very, 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 very anal about <laughs> making sure 
that the energy, and I know you like energy too, but about the energy of whatever I'm putting in anything matches healing energy. And I always feel like it's an oxymoron when you're taking an ingredient that is just like completely wiped out the rainforest yeah. and, and killed all of these beautiful wildlife and birds and, and, and beings. Um, and then we're taking that energy of that plant and we're putting it into our bodies or our animals' bodies and going, okay, now this is going to heal. Like it just doesn't, it just energetically makes zero sense to me. And I feel like that happened when I was really looking at cat stuff. Cause I said to Dion, you know, hardly anyone has cat specific supplements. Like it's all dog, cat, dog, cat, yeah. dog, cat, dog, cat. And he said, yeah, because there's not enough money in cat supplements. People <laughs> don't do it because there's not enough, there's, there's more research, there's more hype, there's more marketing, there's more information on dogs. So cats are kind of getting the short end of the stick. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. Like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> so well, you he's know like, part of that know. is though, <laughs> people, people take their dogs to the veterinarian. So the, the veterinary industry, the researchers, the supplement makers, they're like, Ooh, look at all these dogs we have that need something. And yeah. So a lot of money gets put into that. Cats, only like 25% of cats ever see a veterinarian. So the veterinarians yeah. are like, well, nobody cares about cats. You know, nobody needs supplements for cats, whatever. Just throw food in the bowl and let them be. And that is actually a really good reason why people should start at least taking your cat in for an exam. Don't take them in for all the vaccines. Don't take them in to get the crappy kibble. But, you know, just letting the veterinary industry know that hey you know what cats are important too <laughs> yeah i and, care and about we do my need cat. That. yeah and we do need that research i mean i understand it's mm -hmm. a pain in the but like i've been trying to get blood on one of my cats for a couple of months i'm not having a whole <laughs> lot of luck with this particular cat getting the blood that i need for this cat <laughs> I may take him in and torture my veterinary friend uh, instead. Um, <laughs> but I get it. You know, it's like I'm, I'm going to have to box up this cat and take him for a car ride. And he absolutely hates it because he's not being cooperative enough at home. So um, yeah. I get it. I understand why people don't take their cats in, but it also sort of shortchanges the cat industry. Almost. Industry. Yeah. Be, because mm -hmm. people are like me. Like I, I can honestly yeah. say that the amount of money spent through our company on cat products versus dog products it's it's minuscule yeah uh, and we've worked really hard at trying to get more cat centric and and really be a resource for the cat owners because there just there is not near as much information out there i know <laughs> and the really cats sad. that are and the cats that are going in are usually really sick, like IBD. Yes. And, yeah, by the time and, they go in, you know, they're a train wreck. Yeah. Um, and, and that's then, they're, they're so good at hiding their symptoms, and that's part of the reason very, why. Very. I know. And then they get loaded up with drugs, and then they, you know, it. so for me, I saw a lot of end-stage stuff at my clinic with cats because of Vokra. I mean, I see it's tons of dogs. I saw more dogs than I did cats, but I saw a huge amount of cats. And it was really interesting because I did such a pro act because of people and, and how they deal with cats, with, with vets and things like that. I, I tried to do a lot of stuff that you could do at home, mm. right? Where you didn't have to stress your cat out and go into a clinic and do a lot of proactive stuff with yeah. cats. Because once cats are sick, they're harder to deal with than dogs are, right? They yeah. don't take stuff in their food as easily. <sighs> They get freaked out when you're trying to give them stuff. So it's like, okay, let's try and, you know, so when I was doing all of my like gut soothe stuff, so I have a, I have a gut soothe just for cats and kitty gut soothe. Yeah. <laughs> kitty <laughs> <And gut soothe. laughs> it's, it's a, it, it is, it's, it's such a lifesaver that one little thing when it comes to inflammatory bowel disease, when well, it and comes there, to I mean, this is, constipation. This is, yeah. This is something that you keep it in the refrigerator if you open it, but they don't really object to on their phone. No. It's a very tiny no. amount of powder. Um, it's glucosamine, slippery elm, licorice, marshmallow root, probiotics, large arabidoglactin, and liver glandular. So tastes decent. Yeah. Um, so the cats are, are pretty 
good about today. Actually, I have one of those in my fridge at home. Um, somebody asks what the cats that serve as the fecal donors to start the probiotic strain, the cat specific, were they raw fed kitties? They weren't, not initially. So that's why we're going through the stages. And that's a really good question. And I'll tell you why we've done it that way. Because they're all healthy domesticated cats. And the same with Phytos flora when I started. And then we went straight from Phytos flora to wolf. And, you know, without, without, uh, without really spilling the beans, we're going to be coming out with something for cats that's ancestral just like we did with uh, the wolf. Only so the, the ancestral wolf one, is that more raw fed animals? That's, that's, that's a wolf. That's actually okay. a, th those are actually, that's feces from one of the oldest wild wolf packs in Canada. Cool. So they've been eating raw food and species specific food for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, you cool. know, non, not only not only that, but they're not vaccinated. They don't have antibiotics. They don't have the sort of they have stressors for sure living in the wild. But, you know, just just quickly, because it's going to it's going to it's going to be the same thing when I come out with the ancestral line for cats. But these these animals are living like like people think wolves, but they live out, you know, they're they're dealing with like cold and heat and being cut and not having been being able to be stitched up and they're not being coddled and brought in and you know they have like hardcore um environmental stressors that they need to deal with along with you know losing their homes when they're clear cutting and all that stuff but they don't have they have they're free they breed they fight they have packs they're together so they have they have a very strong social resilient nature but what i wanted to say is that you know they're big dogs some of these gray wolves that we were dealing with they're like you know 135 pounds 140 pounds these dogs wolves and they're living till they're 16 years old they're having puppies when they're 10. Yeah. so when i stand back and i look at that it's like okay what is going on here because that's a healthy animal right like that's a really healthy animal but then you think about it and they don't have, you know, flea stuff and they don't have, you know, vaccinations and they don't have this and they don't have that. And they're not, you know, they have their, and they're sex eating hormones. real food <laughs> and eating... they still have their sex hormones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's like so hormones. many things that we do wrong. Yeah. And they're running all the time and moving all the time. Yep. So anyways, but the reason that I did that is because I, the reason that we started with domestic dogs and and cats that are eating commercial food is because i want to help all animals right i want to be able to be super specific to all the animals that are out there and what you have to remember is a fecal transplant is very different than uh than a probiotic so so when you're doing a fecal transplant you would definitely want it coming from a raw fed dog but when you're looking at historical dna and you're looking at that I'm producing probiotics that that are going to go to masses of people that I'm hoping are really going to help people. So I'm starting sort of at ground zero and 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 giving probiotics, spe species specific probiotics to cats that we, we know have had, you know, healthy, long lives historically, genetically. And and no, no signs of or symptoms of, you know, autoimmune disease or what happened? Can you hear me still? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, you know, historical symptoms, hered uh, genetically of any kind of autoimmune diseases and stuff. But what happens there is then that programs the body into creating a species healthy bacteria. And then we go, we see, we keep stepping up the plate, which is what I want to do. And we keep adding more and more and more. So rather than going from a to Z right away, I'm starting off by creating the diversity that is in that. Because even if you have your kitty and you have been feeding your kitty kibble for a year or your kitty's mama was being fed kibble, and then all of a sudden you're starting to feed your cat raw, that, that, my, that the microbiome that's in the gut that is the native 
bacteria that the kitten was born with will still have that DNA from its mother, mm. right? And its grandmother. So I did a lot of research on this and I really dug into how do I kind of genetically move up the scale to not just going from commercial food to raw food, but commercial food to a wild, a wild species feces, right? Where where you're not only getting the the diet right, you're getting the fingerprint of their resiliency, their ability to live in pack environments, their stress, their stressors, right? Like they don't have the stress, they don't have the adrenaline stress that animals in 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 the cortisol stress right. that that um, animals in captivity or captivity, you know, our, our, our companion animals have. Our companion animals who live with uh, machines that glow and emit EMFs and beep every time we turn around and there's constant bombardment. Yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. We think and that none of that matters, stresses. but it, it all matters. And it especially matters to animals because they're even hyper more acute and in tune than we are. So, you know, and our stress levels and the stress levels of the world and, you know, there's the list goes on and on. So, so from a, from a gut perspective with cats, you're looking at the postbiotic effects of the right, right probiotic and the right prebiotic creating things that, you know, that support healthy healthy gingiva, which is another huge thing with a cat that then it, that then is a precursor to a million other things, right, mm -hmm. that go wrong in the body. And also, you know, the fact that they have to be anesthetized, have their teeth done, right? So it's like, it's like, keep their teeth, try to be more proactive with their dental, dental care. And a big part of that is the, is the microbiome in their gut and in their mouth, yep. right? Absolutely. So it's, it's a, it's, it's just, it's all con all consuming and and you know what what the i always say that the gut is the conductor to the symphony so the gut tells every single solitary thing in the body what to do tells the brain what to do tells what the organs what to do tells what the hormones are supposed to do it it it, it it's the one that navigates the whole system and if the gut isn't healthy the system is sort of like running around blind you know, like, oh, do I, should I go over here? Do I do this? Do I shut down? Do I do more? So they're like, kind of like all over the place until a conductor comes in and goes, no, oh, no, chill out. Just go here and just go there. And yes, let's just do this now. And let's just do that. Stuff. So the immune system is a lot more than just fighting bacteria and viruses. And the gut is creating, you know, the, the, the correct hormones and the correct short chain fatty acids. But that yeah. kind of brings me into like quickly the the prebiotic perspective, especially with cats, because, you know, for me, I won't use prebiotics unless they're functional. So I won't put anything in my dog, cats, horses or my, my myself that doesn't, you know, really create something beneficial or have some type of a medicinal value. So a lot of what we see in as prebiotics are sugars, right? Fructose, mm. FOS, maltodextrin. Um, we're, we're looking at prebiotics, but in the wild, prebiotics would never be something like that. Prebiotics would be, you know, things that other things ate. So the larch that it's in the cat stuff and in, in the, the prebiotics comes from bark. Cause what I did is I went back and went, what, what, if cats can't get chew on chew on things and get their own prebiotics, what would be a prebiotic that a bird would eat, that a mouse would eat, what a squirrel would eat, what a you know a small <laughs> small prey would eat? And lo and behold, everything eats bark. Everything eats bark. Beavers, rats, squirrels, birds—they all ingest bark. And larch is made from bark, and so it. It also has an immune modulating, a science, scientifically proven immune modulation effect. So it helps if the immune system goes down, helps to bring it up. If it goes up, it helps it bring it down. Um, so, you know, that's kind of what, you know, when, when everything goes on steroids and immune suppressive drugs, it just crashes the immune system. We don't have something that modulates it. It either raises it or it lowers it, right? And then it's, there's no balance to that.
Right. So modulation balances it. And then it's also shown that it helps to meta uh, helps to um, derail the metastases of tumors. So it's it's got lots of beneficial qualities without just and, and it feeds the bacteria incredibly. So it's got lots of different things um, other than just putting like I, like I said, FOS or multidextrin. Yeah, yeah in. no, absolutely. And somebody said they're looking for probiotic without sugar for their dog with cancer. Well, there's no sugar in Adored Beast products. I can guarantee no. you that. And so the kitty one is the Felix's Flora. Flora. Sorry, I can't get it. to. Thank you, Joey. I'll go over here. <laughs> um, Felix's Flora. We can't put pictures up on Instagram. I have to hold things up, so it's a little silly. Um, but that also has the larch in it as the prebiotic, so no sugar. Yep. Um, and it has humic and fulvic acids. Talk about those a little bit, because I, I'm in love with the, the soil-based probiotics, the humic and fulvic acid. Um, I, I kind of feel like they're almost critically important. They are critically important. They're <laughs> <Thank> very <you. laughs> critically important. You're right. And that's why we came out with soil and sea, right? So, so, and which can be given to cats. And cats actually really like soil and sea because it's, it's got blue green algae in it, right? So, um, fishy. but <laughs> fishy, yeah. So, fulvic and humic acid, there's different types, but fulvic and humic acid has an incredible ability to do something called chelation. So it helps bind heavy metals and things like glyphosates and things like that to it and pull it out of the body. So, you know, we can't help but, but our animals and ourselves, you know, coming in contact with that stuff. So I put fulvic and humic acid in one for that reason. But there's there's two other really big reasons for it. Humic and fulvic acid is petrified organic. The stuff, this one that I use, is petrified organic material that was covered by the Ice Age. So when the Ice Age came, there are trees and plants and grasses and vegetation that doesn't exist anymore that went into that soil and became petrified and compacted by the weight of the of the of the ice so it's got you know you, if you go and you buy a mineral supplement for your animal it's got you know a very short short amount of of minerals this has about 80 to 90 minerals that you that don't exist anymore right they don't exist anymore and the cool thing is is they can't be replicated commercially they can't be chemically re replicated you can't make like a fake mineral that comes from ful fulvic and humic acid which is amazing and they've proven now there's lots and lots of studies that it helps to create a more integral mucosal lining in the gut so it helps to heal like leaky gut and and, and um uh, mucosal junctions that have been stretched and traumatized. So it does a bunch of different things, a bunch of different things. And I think probably why you love soil base and it's the same with me is that because our food is so void of one bacteria, like there is no, our food is sterilized now. Right. Yeah. So so everything that we're feeding, even if we're feeding raw food, it's coming from a sterilization of how we how we grow food now. Yeah. So there's not the diverse bacteria <clears throat> in our soil that goes into our vegetables. Yep. There's not the diverse bacteria that goes into <clears throat> the grass that then the cows eat, right? Like it's just, it, it just doesn't exist anymore. Yep. So soil based bacterias for probiotics are incredibly beneficial they're amazing for SIBO uh, which is small intestine bacteria overgrowth which is a huge thing right now with cats and yep. dogs and it's great for that it's really good to diversify because you don't want to go out and buy one probiotic or two probiotics you want as many different strains as you can possibly add and then and then adding soil based and then adding species specific based you're getting a really healthy vibrant diversity in the gut which is what you need 
right? Now, it's really you, what you need. Do you recommend? Do you recommend <clears throat> that people give probiotics all the time to their animals? Do you recommend yep. rotation of them? And yep. if you're rotating, how often would you rotate? <clears throat> so I try to make things super simple for people. <laughs> and I think there's too much complication in the world as it is. So yes, I believe, I, I really, really believe that um, the, we should be rotating and I think that they should have it all the time. Okay. And I'll tell you why, if we lived maybe a hundred years ago, then, then maybe I wouldn't, you know, maybe I'd be like, yeah, no, you know what? You only need it when you're on antibiotics or you only need it when you're worried that maybe your immune system needs a little bit of a boost, but how we are, the way our lives are where we're in pollution all the time, where we're under stress all the time, where we're, our food is, di is void of a lot of bacteria, therefore it's void of a lot of vitamins and minerals. That's the other thing that I wanted to talk about too real fast. I recommend it every day, but I definitely re recommend rotation. That's why we have so many different probiotics in our company, right? Like we have tons of different probiotics where you can, and the simplest way to do it is that you use one, run out of it, use the next one, next one. run out of it, use the next one. <laughs> yep. It's, it's that simple. Unless you've got a, a, a deep pathology, if you have a deep pathology and you're on gutsu, let's say, then you can do gutsu, then then you could add Felix flora into it. So that has the species. And then you could do like five days and then three days and then five days and then three days because I've, I know cats that have had such bad IBD, like really, really bad IBD that they need to stay on gut soothe all the time. So what mm -hmm. they do is they do five days on gut soothe and then um, two days on, on Felix flora, five days on gut soothe, two days so that you're, you're mixing, mixing it in it all, mixing it all up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, so somebody, somebody asked, you know, do we only need to do this for cats that are ill? No, we need to do, be doing this for our pets all mm -hmm. the time. Because if your cat lives inside, um, two of my cats live totally inside their choice. The other nine are totally outside, pretty much their choice. They really don't like to come in. Um, mm -hmm. The outdoor cats are so much healthier than the indoor cats because they are eating bugs. They are eating grass. They are eating yeah. soil. They are, you know, rolling around in the soil. Um, they're yeah. eating wild prey. They, they're on a raw diet anyway, but then they are supplementing a lot. Uh, they love to eat grasshoppers. Ew. Um, I just read the other day that there's a really, there's a really weird fluke that they can get from grasshoppers. Really? Something, yeah, some really weird. And I can't even remember what it, I think it causes like liver, it, something with the liver, like copper storage disease or some weird thing. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was one of those rabbit holes that I was going down while I was researching for the book. Um, but anyway, so, but, but there's such a difference in a, a house dweller or apartment dweller cat. So if you live in a high rise in a city and in the cities, the air quality is not great. Usually your windows don't get opened anyway, but you're still filtering in through the air conditioning and everything. And those cats don't ever have soil and they don't, yeah. the only food they get is basically either dead or sterilized. And so they're not getting that. And that's a really high stress. Mm -hmm. Like we think our cats are really chill. They're just, you know, hanging out on the sofa all day, but it's actually a really high stress environment for them because that's not their natural environment. They're not hunting. They're not stalking. They're not playing. They're not getting the exercise. They're not getting the mental stimulation. Um, so I think it's, it's even more important for my indoor cats. Who, yeah because they're not getting that natural exposure. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. absolutely. So yeah, even, though, even though they seem healthy, they're not, yeah. they're not getting what they need. No. And if that's when I was talking about vitamins and minerals and stuff, part of the bacteria, people don't understand this is that let's say you're eating a carrot, right. Or like, I'm just talking about you or your animal is eating. Um, um, oh, my dog's going to bark. Um, you are eating, your cat is eating something. 
the bacteria is what actually um, creates the postbiotic effect to to synthesize the vitamins and minerals. Yep. If you don't have that and you're feeding, if you don't have a really, really strong microbiome, your whatever you're feeding, you're you're not getting even remotely the the benefits from from your food. Not even close. Your your bacteria in your gut, it 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 synthesizes and it creates the vitamins and the minerals from your food. It actually transforms them into that. So it's it's definitely not something that you wait until your cat is sick. It's definitely something that you know, it's, it's whole, it's right up the scale. It's a, it's huge prevention, huge prevention and proactive care for, like I said, teeth and eyes and heart and gut and immune system and hormones and everything. And it also um, really helps with, with animals that are really, really sick. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it, 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 it's everywhere in between, but you know, my advice to people is don't wait till your cat's sick. Yeah, definitely exactly. start them on it as a proactive preventative um, yep. part of their diet. Yep, absolutely. So we've got the gut soothe for those who are having some inflammatory bowel problems, some issues, um, yeah. you know, whatever those issues are, a lot of inflammatory problems in the body. It may not even be showing up as inflammatory bowel disease, but if they have allergies, that sort of thing, start yeah. with the gut soothe and then start mixing in the Felix's flora. And then when your new product comes out, I can't wait to see that. And based on today's conversation, I'm going to change a couple things around for some of my animals. So always, always, always learn something when I talk to you because you Aww. are, you are just a wealth of information. And I am so appreciative that you are willing to take time out of your really busy schedule, um, to come help educate pet owners because it's, it's really critically important. And you just, you have so much information I got, in your brain. I got go I have goosebumps because I, I love coming and especially talking to you because we're so on the same page. <laughs> like you said, you're, you're in there doing, you're in the trenches doing it. And I'm out here going like, here, do this, here, do this, or try this, or do this. It's like, you know, so we're, we're so synergistic. So yeah, th thank you for having me. I love coming and hanging out and talking and well, thank helping. You. And uh, we'll cross paths again soon. I am quite certain. Yes, we will. <laughs> Thanks, Julian. Okay. Thank you. Bye.